This episode of the Absolutely Geek Podcast, we have Mari Takahashi, a.k.a. Atomic Mari. What's up? What's good? What's up? What's up? Things are, things are good. We miss you over here. I, I, in man, state. I miss you guys too, man. Shit. It's too... It, yeah. I, I'm not going to lie. I don't miss the heat. We just talking about the heat. I can't. I, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm so We'll good. meet in Alaska. Where I think I've it's probably nice right now. I've never been there. I've never been there. Have you been to Alaska? I've been there once, but it was like when I was in like getting, I was in between like college and high school. So I like didn't really want to like be on a family trip, you know? So I was like really uh, not wanting to be there. So I don't really remember a lot of the stuff because I'm like, mm. I'm going to go hide in my corner and I don't want to hang out with you sort of stuff. So <laughs> uh, I was there, but I wasn't present. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, how, old you, how old were you, you said? I think I was probably like 18. Okay. So I was like, it, I was in that in between getting out of high school. I was in college, and I'm like, ah, I just, you know, I just got away. I just got out. I don't want to. Right. No, I, you, I don't think, I don't know if that that age, maybe not, but I know for me, coming from Vegas, I don't think I would have been ready to appreciate a place like Alaska, you know? Yeah. At yeah. 18. I don't, I don't think people do. Mm. generally. And people think like, oh, as soon as kids start making memories, that's when you're going to travel. No, kids will not appreciate it until they're paying for stuff on their own. Ooh, so it's like, nice. don't, 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 tr don't let them travel until they're 21 and they're traveling <laughs> on their own. <laughs> go, oh, you want to go there? Pay for it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. My mom, she's been there a couple of times. She's, she's done like, the, they do like, um, what are those things? The, the cruises and stuff that do like that. And they do like uh -huh. the well watching situation and all that. But she's been to like Anchorage and other places up there. She loves it up, up there. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Yeah, really pretty. Like, I don't, there's not really much to do though. Like besides like wildlife stuff. Yeah. No, you look, you, you look at black bears and you try to run away from them. And then, you know, there's fishing. Um, I met somebody the other day from, uh, Black Desert Films. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Black, yeah. is it Black, Black Desert, Black Raven? Black, um, Black Raven. Black, Black Raven. Black okay. Raven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Adam from Black Raven. Yeah, He's Adam. from Alaska. And he lives here. And I'm like, whoa. Alaska I didn't know Adam was Vegas. from Alaska. Oh, chill. Yeah. That's a drastic, yep. oh. Drastic, drastic change. Oh my God. It's like <laughs> polar opposite. They're like, hey, oh, <laughs> I like to freeze and now I like to burn. How, so you like the heat though, like it doesn't feel like oven to you, like it doesn't feel like. Oh, that's no, so weird. No, no, I thrive in it. I was telling Adonis just a moment ago. I was just outside. I think it was it clocked in at one hundred degrees flat. I was still in my sweatshirt and pants, sitting out there, not even sweating. My skin was still cold, so I think I'm just a reptile at this point. Um, You're something. Which is, I'm something. Which is too bad because I want to be scorpion, but I guess I'm a reptile. Oh, I mean, oh, but like scorpion, he's on fire though. He so he he likes the heat. <laughs> he, likes he likes the, the heat. heat. Yeah. I don't know if he wanted to be on fire though. I don't think that was by choice. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> how's how's the how's the move been though? Like going from LA to Vegas. Like how's it been? I love Vegas, honestly. And and like I don't want to paint LA in this like picture that I think a lot of people painted where it's just like, ah, things are toxic and it's terrible and stuff like that. Right. Honestly, I found a really great group of people in LA. Um, and, and, and I think that I found like true family there. Mm -hmm. It was really just the astronomical prices of LA. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fact that it was always on fire. Um, oh, and uh, the, <laughs> the air quality was so bad. Uh, Peter and I, my husband, Peter and I, we moved, during the pandemic, when things got really heightened and bad in mm -hmm. California, um, we were number one in the world in the worst way. Um, right. And so we just got out of Dodge then. And being in Vegas is wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, we, we already had a bit of a community knowing uh, Ismahawk out there and knowing um, our head Orphan Brotherhood, who's the, like the stunt team out there. So we already felt like we knew some folks out here, but... I think if anything, it is the camaraderie and um, the, the the relationships that people have with each other within like this industry of like creation and 
filmmaking mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Oh, it's a it's a really good vibe. I love it. Yeah, I, you know, it's weird because I grew up. I was born and raised there, so like going to LA, it was like, I, I never wanted to go to LA. Like I actually, ne- I was always like. FLA, Vegas all day. Like, cause like Vegas is always like the younger brother to LA, right? So it yeah. was like, it's like, oh, you're like kind of LA, but you're not. Like, you're like, okay. And <laughs> and and being from Vegas, you're like, man, fuck that. Like Vegas, like you're just trying to rep your city, right? And it just got to the point when I finally did move out there. Um, I didn't want to like it. I was like, man, I don't like, I don't like it. But like I really started to really love LA. I was like, man, I really like it out here. And I think it's because, like, I'm confrontational. I like confrontation. So for me, weeding through the bullshit that's in L.A., like, finding who is really what they're about versus the elevator pitch people that just... And I, there was something about that that I just thrived in. I was like, I love that. I love finding the bull, love- going through the bullshit... And they're like, "Ooh, you're 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 one of those. Like, you're you're a good one. Like, yes. Like, there's something about that that is exciting to me. I don't know why. But. <laughs> you're you're the equivalency of enjoying going to a vintage store and finding the gold mine jacket and being like, "Ooh, I found this in a heap of trash." <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. It's, it's. I don't know what it is. I just like that. And then I think too, like everybody's there trying to make something of themselves. Like they're trying to be an artist, a musician, um, trying to t- chase like their, you know, extreme dream of becoming something. And that's intoxicating to me. Like I like seeing people mm. go after what they want to do. So that was just like, ooh. Vegas growing up there was like, it was kind of the opposite. Like you had people that, Like, I would call UNLV University never leaving Vegas. If you go to UNLV, you're stuck. You're never leaving. You're just not. Like, the the main degree there is hospitality. So it's like, if you go there and you get a hospitality degree, you'll make all types of money in Vegas. Um, If you're an attractive woman, if you're broke in Vegas and you're single and attractive, you did it to yourself. I don't know how... Uh, like it, there's this, there, honestly, like there's, there's so much you could do in Vegas financially, the cost of living super low. It mm-hmm. spoils you. Nothing really ever closes. Things are always new. It's a weird thing. So yeah, it spoils you like crazy. People never really want to leave there. Um, it's too much comfort. Interesting. Too much comfort. Too much. So do you feel like that's different now? Do you think the, the, the energy is different now? Uh, I don't know. I I haven't been there, like, living there. When I go back, it still feels like Vegas. But you could tell, like, certain things started to shift a little bit. Um, Ironically and sadly, it was right after that massacre that happened there. Um, That changed everything for Vegas, I think. Mm. Like, I was in Australia when that happened. I was leaving the store, and one of my friends was like, yo, there was a shooting in Vegas. And... To be fair, people in Australia don't really hear that often because there's no guns here like that. So anytime there's a shooting, people are like, oh, did you hear about this? But they know I'm from Vegas. So they're like, oh, there's a shooting in Vegas. And I was like, like, yeah, that shit happens a lot. And I didn't really understand what that meant when she told me that. And she was like, no, like it was a big deal. I was like, what do you mean? So I'm looking it up. I was like, oh, and where it happened, my dad would frequent that spot to do like concerts and stuff all the time. So now I'm freaking out because it's like right across from Mandalay. And I'm like, okay. So I texted my dad, no response. Called my dad, no response. So now I'm freaking oh out. Gosh. I got friends calling me asking if I've seen, uh, if I've heard of, uh, heard from this person or that person or they were at this concert. Like, have you heard from this person? I had a friend call me about her son. Like, hey, it, have you heard from my son? I was like, no, I haven't. Like, so this became like a real crazy thing. But after all that took place, the uh, the whole hashtag Vegas Strong happened. So there was like this big pride in the city. And it immediately led into the first season of the Golden Knights. And they ran with the Vegas Strong hashtag as well. And that just sparked this whole like pride of the city. So when I went mm. back to, to, the, to the States for a convention season that summer... And I went to Vegas and I would see Vegas Strong on all types of stuff. I would see Golden Knight stuff on people's restaurants. And I'm like, that was a huge difference of oh. like pride in the city that I noticed. I was like, oh, this is different. 
Um, because if, unless you were in the arts or something, you really didn't have pride in Vegas like that. Cause you weren't trying to prove yourself to other art based cities like New York or LA. Right. Mm-hmm. So for me, I was like, this is different for people to be like, I'm from Vegas. Like we're, we're here. This is us. I just thought that was dope. So to answer yeah. your question, that was a big thing that was different for me, but I haven't really been there at length besides that. So I couldn't really tell you, but I know people tell me that it's been changing quite a bit. So, mm. yeah, if, it definitely feels like there's a camaraderie amongst people. Like, and 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 I don't want to say that it's always really competitive in LA because there are, you know, like like little pockets of people where right. you can have genuine um, like conversations and you know picking brains and spitballing ideas without it being like a like a I gotcha situation or like, oh, I think this person's gonna steal my idea sort of stuff. Like there are pockets of really good right. people that facilitate that sort of stuff. Um, I think on the macro level, there is a lot of competitiveness and, 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 and I think that you mentioned everyone's trying to make it out there and there's a little bit of that sort of desperation sort of like elbowing to get right. there. Um, but I feel like at least the within the circles that I've been running in around here that I do feel like there is this camaraderie of like, all, all, what is it, like... Rising tides. Uh, rising tides lifts all boats, yeah. yeah. I do feel that around here. And I, I don't know if it feels similar to the Bay Area where I grew up, um, mm. but, it, but I feel like it's a it, it's closer to that than L.A. felt like to, to the Bay Area. So, yeah. I, really like I mean, that. L.A. definitely has that cutthroat, like... I don't want to say cutthroat, but, like, you, you don't really know people's true intentions of why they want to kick it. Or why they're really around you. And I think that's something that, for me, was the interesting part about it. Again, I'm confrontational. So when people <laughs> would ask stuff, I'm like, I'm like, hey, like, let's, like, what do you need from me? Because I, I feel like you need something from me and I'm willing to help you. I just want to know what Hell exactly yeah. <laughs> you actually need. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, what do you really need? Because I feel like this is a little disingenuous uh, at times. So, I agree. I think in the arts or the creative spaces in Vegas, people tend to community grow or try to at least versus mm-hmm. saying like, look, I'm trying to make it by any means necessary. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little yeah. different for sure. How's it? I mean, <laughs> is, is it, is it, cause I'm, I'm assuming you still go back to LA for work. Yeah. Like for, mm-hmm. how's that been? Yeah. Like the commute and all that. I've gone back, I think, maybe, I want to say three times Mm -hmm. during the pandemic till now, uh, Mm. back to L.A. And so, what, uh, we were out here from, like, October-ish of last year, and it's July now. So, between October and July, I've been out there three times. Every Mm. time I've gone out there, I've stayed for about two weeks and either worked on, like, multiple jobs or um, done as much as I can in, in those two weeks. Um, the commute is, I mean, the drive is nice. I don't, I don't mind the drive at all. It's like four and a half hours. And if you think about, you know, driving one way, two hours and and back home, two hours, if you're commuting around LA, living there, that's a total feasible thing that actually happens on a daily basis for a lot of people out there. And so I have that sort of understanding of it. So I'm like four and a half hours to get all the way out to LA on a nice, beautiful drive, nonetheless, it's totally, it's, it's totally fine. But uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's the moments where it's like last minute things show up that those are the times it hasn't happened too often just yet. But I know that as those things happen, when things are back to normal, that's mm. when I'm going to start having a bunch of FOMO. Cause it was something like last week, I got an invite for something on Wednesday of this week. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't do, I can't do that. Right. Yeah, so. I, that's something that I think, um, like Toshi, when he when we got back from the Jabba show from Australia, he immediately like we we would we would go to LA for auditions and stuff like that. But you need to be there for certain things when they happen. Because sometimes like you'll get a call and it's like, oh, I, we need you here at five. It's like, uh, I can't drive there or even catch a flight in time to catch that. So I remember when he we got back in 2012 from Australia and he decided to go out to LA. Um, because of that, like, there's just like, you know, like, it doesn't make sense for me to keep trying to do auditions and do a turnaround. And sometimes those auditions are tree shake, like they'll, you'll go there 
and they'll typecast you as soon as you walk in. All right, line up. All right, go home, go home, go home, go home, stay, 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 go. Like, so oh, he'll drive out for so four brutal. hours and get typecasted immediately. You're oh, like, oh, brutal. Yeah. And it's like, like, sometimes it's just like, oh, you're too tall, right? 100%. Like, you're just, you're, it's just, it's just one thing. It's like, yep. oh, fantastic. You're, you're a perfect fit. Your height's wrong. Yep. You know? And, and, yeah. that, and that's, that's all it is. Um, I hope that through this pandemic, a lot of that, that sort of, um, I think it's really like, I feel like it's, it's, it's an abuse of power within like the industry. Cause mm. I think that that is a lot to ask of for a lot mm. of people to drive right. out, take a lot of time and energy just to be shot, like shoot away within like 15 minutes of being there. Right. And I think that it's almost like, this toxicity that's become okay because that's just how it is. Obviously in the past year and a half in the pandemic, things have had to change with how casting goes. There's right. a lot more um, video like self tapes and, and, and video that happens as an audition. And I have to hope that that has been beneficial for casting directors as well in the sense that they get to blow through a bunch more tapes see a lot more people in a day. They get to kick back and stay in their pajamas all day. And right. they're themselves not renting out a place, um, having an assistant to be there with them, mm. uh, making chit chat with people before their auditions. If the, you know, like the, all right. of that is just gone. And I have to hope that it stays. Yeah, I would hope so. I would hope so. I think some of the industries just get stuck in how, how it is. Like, oh, well, like you said, but I think it's, it doesn't allow innovation to step in and say, can this be better? Like, could, mm. could this process be better? And to your point, pandemic strikes and then people are like, oh, well, we can work remotely. We should be able to work remotely, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but you've been able to do this for years. Like, you've been able to work remote for years. It's just nothing has really pushed you into acknowledging that that was a, a, a reasonable and feasible scenario for you. So yeah. a part of, and we talk about this a lot, but like the paradox of great things coming out of terrible situations, mm -hmm. like, and this is one of those things where there's been a lot of good, you know, business wise and creative wise that come out of the pandemic, I think, because people are forced to think different on how they approach stuff. It's like, okay, well, how do we run our business now when people can't walk into our stores? How do we make money as a restaurant when people can't sit in the restaurant? How do we market and communicate with people through creators online and utilize their network? Like there's, you know, a lot of stuff has started to shift. So yeah. it's interesting to see how it's working, but I don't know to your point when it gets back to normal, what does that actually mean now? Like what, no. what is going to be the new normal? What's the new normal? We still don't know. We're still in like the, the, the interim. We're in limbo at the moment. At least we are in the States. You guys in Australia, I feel like have been living your lives for a while. <laughs> some of us, some of us, Melbourne is just, they've had, they've, man, Melbourne has went from like the most, enjoyable place to live on the planet like it was like rated like the best city in the world to live in to like one of the worst people hate it there okay. people are leaving in mass yeah because of Why? the i guess some of the things that they've been struggling with in in the the pandemic has been leadership on uh on quarantines uh i guess some of the quarantine outbreaks that would happen because People are having sex with people in the quarantine hotels and it's spreading out of the quarantine hotels or, um, yeah, I or thought people, the quarantine hotels were like government, government mandated, like with guards, not in Melbourne. It wasn't they. So, so each state, their own PM was handling it certain ways. And Queensland, she was like, look, we're going to do this through the government. We're going to have X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And in Melbourne, I guess from what I've read is that they decided to go with the private company to do X, Y, and Z, and it just went to shit. So you had this crazy outbreak there last year, and they were on quarantine for like, I think four months, like just hard, oh, like geez. lockdown. 
I'm talking about you couldn't, you could be outside for an hour a day type of thing. Uh, like it, it tanked the city. The morale went down and they've just been going in and out of lockdowns. They, I think they're on like their third or fourth lockdown. Like, jeez, they're yeah. the, they're the California of, uh, it's, it's, it's wild. <laughs> Melbourne's the, the, Melbourne's the United States of Australia. <laughs> yeah, it's right. It's like, I'm like, damn, but it's one of those things where it's a leadership thing. Right. And then yeah. you can't really get mad at certain people till they get to a point of like, man, F this, I'm just going to do what I want. Cause I just feel like everything we've left, we've left certain things to you guys to lead us through X, Y, and Z. And you've taken zero accountability. You've, you know, led us astray on so many things. And we're just kind of like, we're over it. Mm -hmm. So people are either leaving or they're not abiding by certain rules anymore. Like, oh, mask, man, whatever. Or you can only have a certain amount of people at a club. And they're like, nah, (laughs) nope. (laughs) Like people are over it. They're just over it. And it's, I can't really blame them for feeling like that either. Where it's like at a certain point, People are going to be, they're going to just, personal responsibility just kind of comes in. It's like, you know what? If I if I get it, I get it. Like, people just don't care at a certain point. Oh, yeah. people are such people, aren't they? People are yeah. people. People it's are like, people. Oh, it's rough. And it's, it's like, this wouldn't keep happening if you just locked it down and you did it right. But it's like, you can't make everyone do it. And so then you're just kind of stuck back again. It's like, it's like, um... Uh, a, a science project where you're you don't pass unless your entire group works, and there's right. going to be the one person who's like, "No, you do it." I have soccer after school. And it's like, no, Derek, <laughs> no. you <laughs> have it, to do Derek. it too. We're gonna Damn fail it, if you don't Derek. show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, definitely, that plays into it as well. I think also there's. I think because there was so much confusion early on with Mm. what the virus was, what was going to work, what didn't work, what to use, what not to use. And there was so much back and forth that people started to not know what to believe. Conspiracies just began to thrive even more because of the ambiguity and the lack of transparency on stuff. And I think it's a worldwide thing of like, you know, I don't really get upset at people that have feelings good or bad about how things were handled because I feel like everybody's feeling is justified in the fact of people are like, well, I was already weird about the government and now you told us to do this, now not to do this, now you got to do this, now you shouldn't do this. Oh, but it's okay now. Like, I can understand how that would feel more of your conspiracy about the government yeah. of like, y'all not even telling us what's going on. You said this was good. Now it's not good. Like, so I can understand how people get to where they got to. Um, and it's just, it's one of those unfortunate scenarios where it's like, nobody really, none of the governments that I've seen on TV talk about stuff ever came out and said at the beginning, look, we've really never dealt with this in our time, in our lifetime. And there's going to be mistakes that we make. There's going to be things that we're learning on the way. So if things change, just bear with us. We're going to try, like, there was no transparency of like, I'm a human just like you do. And, and you are, and I don't know what we're supposed to do. Like That seems like a, a wonderfully truthful conversation that I think most of us deserve. <laughs> like, what do you think what it, they're like, if they're like, we don't know, it's probably really bad. You guys should probably like <laughs> be safe and mask up. Because right. we don't know what it is. I wonder right. if that would have been better than being like, we have it under control. Just right. stand by. They're like, no, yeah. it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be really bad. Save yourselves. Right. Or, or, I mean, it could be that. It could have been like, look, we don't really know how bad this is, but j- maybe just take the precaution right now until we know more about it. And we'll update you as we learn stuff. But you yeah. have that. Then you have, I think, like the vaccine situation is the in- most interesting thing, I think, mm-hmm. because like I have friends that are like, no, there's no way I'm taking it. Right. They're like, nope, not doing it. Um, and a lot of that could stem from the you know, they're like, oh, well, isn't it interesting that you have a vaccine that comes out like that, but then they couldn't cure this or that. And it's like, look. I'm not a scientist. I don't think you're a scientist either. Let's start there. Yeah. Let's start. Let's start with yeah. the we're not scientists. Let's start there. 
But I don't I mean, think I don't think in our lifetime though we've had something to this level where you had almost all the scientists in the world trying to find a cure or not a cure but agreed. a vaccine for it. So like agreed. it could have sped up said process. I, I I completely agree with that. It's like yeah, that is weird. Yes, but we're also in a completely desperate situation. Right. And most of the decisions that fueled something as big as this, as as big as coming up with a solution as quickly as possible, is usually fueled by desperation and money, which they mm. had. Yeah. Plenty yeah. of. And it's like, it sucks because it's like, could this, could this sort of fervor cure something like cancers? You know, like, right. if the whole world really did come together, could it, yeah. could it happen? Right. Yeah, that's an interesting it's, one. It's it sucks because the answer is so ambiguous. We have no idea if it could or not. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah. I'm I'm curious to see like how this affects like conventions moving forward. Like, what does that look like coming back? Because I know they had like a lot of internet based conventions like over last year. And it's so not the same. It's not. It's, 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 it's real not. cute. It's real cute. It is. It's real it's cute. cute. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> you know what the most pretentious thing I said this year was? I said, I feel like I experienced E3 like everyone who doesn't go to E3 this year. And Yo. I didn't like it. <laughs> Yo, facts though. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's 100% facts. I'm like, man. Because like, there's a part of you that, that you kind of work up to being able to get to the level of being having access to go to E3. Like you work, you build up to that and like you apply and like, oh, I'm finally able to go to E3 yeah. and experience yeah. it this way. So I've there's been accepted I, into it. Yeah. So there's like, there's a, I think that's a tangible, uh, a, a, a realistic say. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's bad to say. Like, it's like, look, I man. I like the light. I miss the yeah. parties. The parties Next are Next year's E3 is going to be disgusting, man. People yeah. are going to yeah. They're going to turn up like crazy. Yeah. 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 For sure. X- oh, my gosh. The Xbox and Twitch parties are always like bananas. Yeah. I, I remember. Um, did I go to the Xbox party the last time I went? Because the last time I went, I was there when. Um, ah, too bad. Cyberpunk was announced with, with uh, when what's the name was actually. Keanu. Actually, actually I, I, we saw you in line, actually. I think you were walking. I was like, oh, bye. I think. Uh, you were there for the 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 um what's it called is too right that event for the uh, um yeah yeah uh, um showcase yes Xbox so showcase. like that was dope I was like oh this is fire it was okay. dope dude when Ke- like experiencing Keanu like walking out on stage and people yeah. being like what what yeah. what Neo what yeah exactly like, that was magical you know what's so funny is like we were there when that meme was created the yeah. you're breathtaking like we were there like we were in the yeah. audience. When he's like, we the guy the was like, gasping. <laughs> right. The guy was like, you're breathtaking. He's like, you're breathtaking. Like, I was like, yo. And then you see it all over the internet. Like, I was like, man, Keanu is goat, bro. He's awesome. Dude, nothing. He's unstoppable right now. And, and he just seems like from all the stories and lore around him, he just seems such, yeah. like such a nice person, which is cool. Yeah. I'm so glad that he's getting... Like his his John Wick series took off because like there was a lot there was a while where I'm just like ah oh, Keanu like there's this movies that he was in and I was like oh, this isn't it my guy like and <laughs> you know because you see him in Neo as Neo and you're like okay and it fits his personality like his very monotone chill vibe yeah and then some roles just don't fit him like that like and you're just like uh mm, okay but mm-hmm. John Wick is like it's so good. I'm so glad. I'm happy that it's like taking him to the level where he should be at again. That's dope. Same. It's it's kind of of like reflective though of just how long some things take. Yeah. You know, and like that sort of like lull happens in all areas and whatever it is that you do and right. um having the patience to to keep going. Yeah. And to get, you know, I don't know, I don't know if he felt like he was in a rut, but like for those of us who are excited about Keanu like mm-hmm. movies, it's like we're like, when is when's when's the next one? When when's the next hit? When's it gonna come? You know, and I'm sure Thanks. that pressure is felt, but continuing to 
to chisel at it is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I think for, you know, creators, like we kind of go through those, I think, where you'll have this crazy momentum and it'll be boom and you're growing and growing and then it gets stagnant and it kind of chills for a little bit and it's not as exciting and you're like, damn, like people are actually, like people really fuck with my stuff right now or not or, you know, you kind of have this question, yeah. you're questioning stuff, like, ah, oh, it's not really popping like it was, but, and then you get another one. You're like, oh, okay, we're on. So, like, there's like, like you said, those like, hills and valleys but on the level of somebody like a superstar it's like what i don't even know what that would feel like to yeah be on you know the top of the world essentially where everybody's like oh you're a household name vibe Mm -hmm. and then you put something else out and it doesn't meet the expectations of the masses and you kind of just get you know pushed to the wayside for a little bit even though creatively you're still trying to create and explore stuff and some things still aren't met to or received the way that you would want them to be received. Like, I don't even know what that would feel like. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that it's just a constant reminder as viewers to be mindful of it and Mm. like understand that there's a human behind all of it. Because who knows, who knows how much, you know, somebody like that is affected by, the worldview of that person, maybe it was unaffected completely. And I'm not trying to like uh, project any sort of feelings onto, onto Keanu's situation. But like, I think that at the end of the day, what matters are like the wins, right? That's what people really remember as opposed to like the things that were down here. And so Mm -hmm. like as creators to keep trudging on and not get so bogged down by like how others might see you, yeah. Um, it's so important and you just gotta, you just gotta keep going until those hits are, are there. I, there's this, um, really, really old and I'm, I can never find this quote because it was just this, I heard it, it on was, radio. It was before the internet. <laughs> it was before the internet. This is when I was listening to NPR in the car. Oh, wow. And, um, and so it's not like I could look up this episode because I'm sure right. it hasn't been... Uh, uh, you know, like put through um, onto podcasts or anything like that. But Ira Glass had this really great saying of like anyone who's won any sort of accolade, whether it's a an Oscar or a Grammy or whatnot, it's like they got there, and that's what you remember. But they had mm. to they had to make so much crap before they got there. Facts. And so, as a creator, what you have to do is just make a lot of stuff and make a lot of crap and be okay with it. And little by little, you're going to be bringing up that bar of Mm. like what you expect yourself to create, because Mm. then that's going to be what, what you expect of yourself. But there's going to be a lot of trash before you're going to get to, to that peak. Um, And so to be patient with yourself, I think it's so important. Yeah. That patience is huge. I think early on, I feel it's way worse now because of, I think because the access social media gives you to see the people you admire and what they're doing, that microwave mentality has just become so the norm of like, I want it now. Like I mm. I do this, I see this person killing it. It's like, yeah. I remember when Justin Bieber had came out and I, I remember people saying like, oh my, he was overnight success. Like it took him like eight years to become an overnight success, bro. Like <laughs> this kid's been, you know, going on YouTube, creating videos, you know, talent shows. Like I know that road. Like I was in the music game for a while. Like I know that road. So I think that's something that viewers and fans, they only see the, like you said, the, the moment that the switch turns on. Like, oh, yeah. he's Justin Bieber. Or he's Neo or whatever. Yeah, Yeah, that it's I think on the other side of that, though, is like the Britney situation. Like, I remember when when we were going when Britney started having her, you know, the public started saying or the media was like, oh, she's having a meltdown and she shaved her head. and, Mm -hmm. And people were going all about that. And, you know, obviously more has come out now for us to understand what's what, you know, what could have been transpiring. But. At the time, I remember like, oh, Britney's going crazy, blah, blah. And it's like, let's let's time out really quick. Like, let's let's take a step back and understand. Let's say that 
everything you did as a human being was <laughs> on camera, was scrutinized. Every person you dated, people had opinions on, was talked about. Uh, any mistake you've made was publicized and ridiculed uh, on a consistent basis, let alone be a teenager. Yes. Like, let that sink in really quick. <laughs> like, let that yeah. sink in really quick. And then tell me, like, that's a strong person to be able to do that. At a certain point, mm -hmm. everybody has a breaking point. Everybody does. So for me, I remember when that came out, I was like, no. I was like, I've seen, I know what people go through to become stars in the music game. Like, I know the work they put in. I was like, they're, they're not weak people at all. Like, you mm -hmm. can't be weak to do that. You have yeah. to have the ridiculous, relentless, I'm going to be here in the studio for eight hours and try to knock something out, no sleep, do it again tomorrow. Like, I've seen that. So I don't know of, of people being weak, being that type of a person. Like, that is almost non-congruent. Yeah, it's really, it's really yeah. strange. I, I think that it's, um, I, I think it's always been around with media and critics. But mm. now everyone is allowed to be a critic. Everyone right. has a voice. Anyone who has a, 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 a Twitter handle, mm. in essence, has the ability to amplify their own voices more than just talking in a room with somebody about somebody's right. opinion. Right. Um, and, and I think that folks who have never been in any sort of industry that you share in Mm. can have such strong opinions about something that they have never done before in their own lives and how that much can affect that creator is really, really unfortunate because yeah. those sort of comments shouldn't have the same weight as somebody who is in the industry who knows what they're talking about. Right. So often the, 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 the rando troll who... <laughs> works at a spaghetti place talking about right. how how to drum better <laughs> will right. get under someone's skin to the point you know of of wanting to absolutely crumble and that's extremely unfortunate it's yeah. too bad um i i always think of the you know uh, it's a, it's a gary v quote but it's something along the lines of like don't be bothered by the people booing and jeering in the um, in the stands because they'll never be the same people who are going to be playing on the field with you. And True. those people understand. Those people get it because they are playing the game. Everyone on the stands wearing the jerseys, they don't know what it's going to feel like to be on that on that field. So Correct. it's that's the thing that brings me back to like, I'm down. Those those opinions don't matter. The ones that do matter are the ones who have an actual foothold in the industry I'm in. Right. Um, but it gets hard because there's a yeah. lot of voices out there. <laughs> right. And I, I think, too, you know, I think in the creator space, it's really hard to not look at comments like you're like because there's there's there is a I mean you're a dancer so you get this right off the bat of you put energy out there you want energy back you're on stage you you're given this you need, you need yes. it it's like it. it's something about that so as a creative person you put something out on the internet you want response you want something reciprocated so reading comments it's not necessarily a validation it's just energy received like you you need energy back but then sometimes people, they read things and they're like, this is not the energy that I wanted. I wanted mm -hmm. this energy, right? And that, depending on the person, there's, you know, levels to what people can take. And yeah, it's it's a tough one for sure. It's a tough one for yeah. sure. I, uh, I, I think, I, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Um, going back on, on Brittany and her, her situation of like, it all transpiring, what, 15 years later? I mean, is that, like, the right timeline? Like, maybe, maybe like, 10, 10 to 15 years later? I mean, to have to sit on that trauma for that long, having anyone and everybody commenting, like you said, on everything that she has done, having paparazzi at the ready 
just to see her fail. Coming out of a car door to, to look up her skirt and get a picture. You know, it's like the, the most asinine, disgusting sort of folks who are waiting for you to fail for so long and being such a young person. Um, to have to have sat on that for so long, and I think that, that, that she's probably one of the worst uh, targets or like she got it the worst as a target. Mm. But there are so many other folks like her. Uh, Paris Hilton is a really good example of somebody who's starting to really come out and, and talk about her situations and her experiences. And mm-hmm. it's a really good um, calling bullshit on all of ourselves because I'm I know that I'm most definitely not, um, you know, some angel who never participated yeah. In, in talking about it, enjoying it, you know, I, I was definitely like a Justin Timberlake fangirl. And when they started dating, I'm like, ah, I hate Britney, you know, like I was that person. And so I know that I'm not innocent in it, but I think it's important that now we can call bullshit on ourselves and be like, oh, we got to be better. Yo, that, you know, that's, that's like probably one of the things that I wish people could do more often like i think because cancel culture became the norm and i i think cancel culture kind of grew out of an overcorrection of calling out bullshit to where it's like okay this is trash going on weinstein kind of started the whole vibe of me too cancel like that whole that kind of was like a catalyst for a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. But then I think things overcorrected a lot of like they went way too far the opposite direction. It almost became like a light, a light scenario <laughs> with light from uh, from Death Note, where it's like Death we're Note. doing good, but it's going too far. Like we've went too yeah. far, and now we're on the other side and of it. Now and, we're yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's I think people are like, I well, I look at that this post, this post, this dude talked about something in seventy five, and I can't believe like. What was the what was the what was the time in 75? Like what was the context of the world at that time? Like people going back trying to cancel old comedians from comedy sketches they did 30 years ago. It's like that was the temperature of the society mm-hmm. at the time. Like you it's ridiculous and I'm like guys yeah. like it's okay to be like yeah that's like that don't hold up now cool. But it's also yeah. a great time capsule to be like Man, like that was what was going on back then. Yep. So like it's it's a weird thing that I think people can't. There's no oops anymore. There's no oh my bad. There's no, that doesn't exist. It's like oh mm-hmm. you're on record saying this. Like yeah, bro. But I also said stupid stuff when I was 18 as well. Like you've never said something dumb when you were a teenager or a young adult. Like I say stupid stuff now. So yep. Like, yeah, ugh, I don't. Yeah, I I think that there needs to be um, a, a, an understanding that we are all human. And prior to, I would say, three years ago, maybe like we were all like the, our degree of assholeness as humans were was much higher. Right. The collective. Right. Not. I I wouldn't say anyone was a perfect angel. Right. You know, and and I think that it's it's okay that we are all collectively trying to get better and we will make mistakes, but that's human. And right. it, and it's not out of um it, it's not out of trying to hurt, but I think that there's a lot of like we're trying to rework our entire livelihood so far and question like, oh, yeah, maybe that is problematic. I I probably shouldn't, you know, I probably shouldn't dot, dot, dot. But it's a lot of remapping what was perfectly okay, mm. okay, societally. Um, and so I, I think that, that there needs to be a little bit of understanding that there's going to be mistakes made. You know what joke I always make? Hmm. I always say, if Captain America was realistic... He would. He would not. He would not be okay if he. If he. <laughs> if 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 he, you know, was frozen around World War Two and right. he came to today. Do you know how much like like lower back uh, holding he would be doing on Black Widow and like any woman he came across? How much? Hey, sweetie, uh, sort of situations going on and just like I mean, sexism, right. racism, homophobia, all of it. 
would be to a point where we're like, oh, we can't have Cap on this. We need to, <laughs> right. We, can't, we need to put Grandpa back to sleep. Give Grandpa's right. meds. <laughs> Yo. There would need to be HR. HR would be his sidekick. Right. Not Just, sidekick. <laughs> Captain America and HR. <laughs> HR would just be there to be like, mm mm. Not today. Mm mm. Mm mm. Apologize. And she'd be like, or he'd be like, here, we have the apology already. already. <laughs> Here's a statement. <laughs> That's it's actually just, hilarious. Like, it's like, it's, it's just, it's, it wasn't that long ago, but the world was different. We did yeah. not, we were not sensitive. We were not collectively sensitive to it. And I think, a lot of people were thinking it, but we were gaslit by the community and the world of like, well, I can't possibly make this a problem because not a single other person finds it a problem, even though they probably did find it problematic. We just mm. started talking about it, you know, and it's like we're, we're all in therapy right now. And I think while we're in therapy, it's hard to not want to point fingers, but it's also not the right move, I think. Yeah. Not, can't scrutinize everything. Yeah, I think that's the thing, too, where... So you have that, I agree. I think there's an equally frustrating scenario of unnecessary bifurcation of making people become your enemy if they don't agree with you. Mm. And that, I just... And I don't know if it's an oversensitivity of, of uh, maybe an overcorrection of cancel culture, maybe an overcorrection of, of things, but... That to me, it it it's not infuriating, but it's it's disappointing. I'm like I was thinking about this. I think yesterday, actually. Mm. Um, I, I I was wondering, you know, I was just kind of mulling it over in my in my head because I didn't come up with an answer. Mm. Um, but I think I was just playing devil's advocate in my own mind about it, and I'm like, right. is not necessarily threatening your friendship with somebody or your relationship with somebody, but like is saying to somebody else, if you don't have the same belief system as me, then this is over. Is right. that a, a form of like abuse? Is that a form of threatening? Is it a form of toxicity? Like by saying that, or is it the reverse, you know? And, and I don't think mm. I really came up with the, with an answer because in some ways, I guess it's really nuanced. It depends on what what the topic of, of the subject is. Um, mm. Like if somebody does not agree with the way you live your life, let's say, mm. um, let's say it's your sexuality, then, then perhaps that might really sever a tie. But by saying like, if you don't change, then this is over. Like, I wonder if that's correct or if, it, or if the right way to say it is like i i don't know i'm not really sure i haven't come up with an answer in my head but um mm. i know that in the states being a republican these days is synonymous with being a trumper and prior to four years ago that wasn't a thing if you're a republican and you're a democrat and you're somewhere in between you could still shake hands with the other side of the aisle and say, it's different what you believe in, but, we, but there's still some middle ground. It wasn't this mm. sort of um, like lock you up in a, in, a, in, a, in a box and let me throw you away. Um, because I also don't think that that is a solution either. Um, but it's very much mixed in with a lot of emotions. And I'm not sure yeah. how much we need to take emotions away when we talk about these sort of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think the answer still eludes a lot of us on how to go about it. I also think that, you know, censorship online is, I can understand people wanting to make sure things that are said are real things that aren't, you know, uh, aren't trying to change a realistic thing that are a factual base statement. Mm -hmm. The challenge right now is 
people don't trust certain sources. So regardless, if somebody says, let's just say hypothetical, Twitter says, this is, this is false, right? And you have people in the belief that anything that this company does is based in democratic views, and they're now saying we can't talk about X, Y, and Z. There's, a, there's, you can understand why people be like, this is a little sketch, like this is a little weird. Like, so you're saying that because we don't believe what you believe, you can't have this on this platform because they don't trust that source, right? And I think that comes into the idea right now is what's factual? People, people want to believe certain things so much that they only trust sources that they follow. But then it's like, how do you know that that's a trusted source? Like, wouldn't that still be as biased as another view with a democratic leaning? Like, uh, you know, like, so it's what now becomes real, factual information to follow. So it's, it's so, it's so complex. And I don't think that there is a solid black and white answer, but I think that's the, that's the problem is nobody wants to compromise. Mm -hmm. There's no compromises. It's like, it's either our way or it's not. And it's like, right. that's, and I think it, the basic human nature of stuff is a lot of people want the same stuff. It's just how we want to get there are, there's different ways to get there, right? Yeah. I want to go to McDonald's. Cool. You want to take the freeway? I want to take the surface streets. Well, you take the freeway. You're an idiot. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> like, that's what it sounds like. It's like, we all kind of want to go to yeah. the same place, but- how we're going about it is different and nobody wants to compromise mm -hmm. at all. And yeah. I think that, that it's important that to realize that like, you can't just poof, like make people disappear. Yeah. We're all part of a collective community and we're all, we're all part of it. And it's, it's kind of, I don't know why I'm reminded by it, but I'm reminded of uh, like the jail system mm. and how those in jail are kind of like a forgotten people. And mm. Especially during COVID, you know, like it was, it was really, really bad in mm. within jails, um, and and I think that there was a sort of thought that it's like, well, they're in jail, they deserve to be there. There are terrible conditions with COVID is is well deserved, and it's not our problem. Right. Um, but the big piece of the puzzle is like those people at some point will be on parole and they're going to be back out in, in our community. And we mm. can either treat them terribly and and lead them to failure, that they're just back in the system, or we can treat them in a way we, are, we understand that they're going to be back into the, in a community and they can be human individuals who right. are accepted and can live the rest of their lives. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that it's probably a pretty controversial sort of um, thing, but you can't just make people disappear. You know, it's like, we're all yeah. part of all of this. We're all part of this machine. That was a weird one. I think cause like, I look at jail as like adult detention. It's like, <laughs> you're supposed to go to the, you go to detention because you did something stupid or you weren't, you were acting up and they're like, look, you're gonna write these sentences out, <laughs> you know, or mm. you're gonna do extra work or, Basically, you're you're there to to understand like I did something wrong. I don't want to be here again. And you correct and move on, move on. But for whatever reason, we don't treat we don't treat people in jail like that. It's like, no. oh, you're in jail. You must be horrible. It's like they go to like murder or you know, oh, you beat somebody's grandma or like you go to like the extremities. Like somebody probably had marijuana on them and got arrested and now they're in jail and all of a sudden they're this terrible person. It's yeah. So I feel like there's not a lot of gray area when it comes to that. But agreed, agreed. Yeah. I think there's just not enough education around it either. Where it's just mm. like it, it, it feels like that sort of cutthroat. Like, oh, you screwed up. All right, well, that's on you. As opposed to like, oh, you're right. gonna be back. You're gonna be back on on the same. <laughs> right. I'm walking in. Oh, we're gonna go to the same grocery store. Oh, then I hope that you have come out of it uh, with a deeper understanding as opposed to like, right. I don't know. I, I yeah. feel like there's, there's such a lack of humanity in all of that, but. Yeah. Where's the reform inside? Like, isn't that the idea of jail is like, okay, we're going to get you in there. We're going to level you up. So when you come out, you're not doing the same thing that you were doing when you got into jail. Like 
That yeah. should be the, it the. It shouldn't be like, all right, see you in a, see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks. We, we love having you here. <laughs> we need more memberships. Right. Like, like, <laughs> it really should be like, I really hope I never see you again. Right. But. Because you did but, the work uh, in there. Yeah. Like you did the work in there like to help them not come back. Yeah. Yeah. That's and really it's interesting. the reverse, right? Like the like society is like, well, you're in jail for whatever it is. And, 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 and those who are like, you know, like the the echelon of like terrible stuff. Yes. Right. I think that it is a, a, a place that that is necessary, mm. but not all things are created equal. Right. And as a society, we shouldn't be like, see ya. We're never going to, you know, like out of out of out of my hair. Right. Because it's not sustainable that way. I don't know. Yeah. It made me think a lot. I'm like, as 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 people, we need to, I think, just scale it back a little bit. Understand yeah. people from a human level. I think the pandemic, though, helped. Uh, hopefully, it helped a lot of people to kind of take a step back and kind of look at things a little differently. I know for myself, it was a huge, like, reveal for, like, my mm. personal stuff and, like, my focuses, things that I really took maybe for granted or overlooked or, you know, in a lot of readjustments for myself in that period. Um, and hopefully other people had a, a, had that, had some level of experience with that. I remember when we yeah. went in the, to lockdowns and I had went live on, on Insta and I was like, I was like, guys, this is a crazy opportunity. And I, I was like, when in human history, since you've been alive, have you been given time by yourself? <laughs> To be like, look, you can't work right now. You can't do X, Y, and Z. You're by yourself. You have time to do whatever it is you've been wanting to try to do, read, catch up on, whatever. Obviously in the confines of your house, but like, I was like, so if, you, if you're if you coming out of quarantine the same way you went in, I think you're doing it wrong. So <laughs> take the time to, to reassess. Like, that's like time that... Our parents didn't get like, hey, you got a couple months, man, to figure something out or or yeah. or just look at where you are. Like, do I like where I'm at? Do I want to switch something up? Some like you don't have that time. We've never got that time. So Dude, when I know the whole world is on pause. Yeah. We'll, ne we'll never see that again. No. Not if we do this right, but we'll never see that right. again. <laughs> Correct. Never. If if we do this right, then yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, no, you're totally right. I I I think I had some moments of like, oh, the pressure's on, mm. you know, and I'm yeah. like, I better I better figure out what it is that I want to focus on. Mm. And for me, I was like, it ain't gonna be fitness. <laughs> I'm like. <laughs> I, I'm like I'm like, I got a list of things that I could tackle and focus on. I'm like, hey, yeah, six pack abs, and not this time around. Not this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Maybe next <laughs> pandemic. That one <laughs> Maybe the next pandemic, yeah. I'm Yo. like, it ain't going to be that one. But yeah, no, you had to focus on something. Yeah, I mean, what was, I mean, in that time, like, because I, I did see a couple times, like, you had posted a couple of dance things while you were, you were uh, on lockdown. Like, what? Did I just like like you just needed to get some emotion off your chest? Like what was what was the reason for that for yourself? I think I think dance has been always a volatile uh, way for me to express myself because mm -hmm. there it, it's like the best way for me to express myself, but to get there there is so much baggage. Mm. Um, and, and it comes from me starting when I was two and it being a, a life path that was forged for me already. It was kind right. of like, look at the cement path. It's already paved. All you got to do is walk on it. Mm. And I walked on it for a very long time. And it wasn't until adulthood that I really understood that because I didn't forge it, it didn't feel like mine and I didn't mm. feel completely fulfilled in it because it wasn't really my doing. Um, Got that's, it. that's how I felt. I put in all the effort. I put in all the, the time and the energy, but it felt like it was chosen for me and not, not for me. 
or not that something that I chose for myself. Um, mm. But at the same time, having put in almost 30 years into it, it is the language that I speak. Right. And so I think in some, in some ways it is um, like speaking again, but it's very different now, right? Like mm. I, I used to dance six days a week, eight hours a day. And now it's kind of like having forgotten that language and starting it up again. Mm-hmm. And I have to be patient with myself, which I'm not a very patient person. Um, so there's a Me lot neither. of ups and downs, but... <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> it's not a good combo when you're not patient and you expect a lot from yourself. Right. Um, but, you know, it's it's kind of like a... It's, it's it's something that I know will always be there. And mm. now I feel like it is there as a tool for um, therapy for myself as opposed to something that I absolutely dread. Because um, I think I'm just in a much better headspace. Before, uh, dancing was akin to seeing myself as just a body and nothing more. And what content creation has allowed me to do is not only curate the audience that sees me for me and sees me for my my wit and my intelligence and the way that I speak and how I carry myself and what I do mm-hmm. as opposed to just being a shell. And I right. think with dancing, a lot of the times I, I felt like I was just a shell that was put on a weight, on a, on a, on a scale to see how much I weighed every week. Mm. And as long as if I pass that, I'm like, well, I got a job. So... It's 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 taking a different taking a different path has given me the fu- the the fulfilling needs so that I'm able to do a little bit of that dancing and not have it get so wrapped up and caught up in my head. No, that's kind of wild cuz I I would I I could never imagine doing that level of dance for that long like you have because I started mad late, right? So for me, it was a completely different thing and I kind of fell into it. So, but even when I was in that and kind of came to the realization that I love dance, but I'm not in love with it, right? Mm. And and I would see Toshi and my other really close friends on A-Team, when we weren't dancing, what were they doing? They were watching dance stuff. They were listening to music. They were trying to find new music, going to battles, going to sessions. Like, I was not, doing that i was reading mm-hmm. i was watching anime i was into tech stuff i was looking at, i was i was being a nerd in in that space so you know cars and next so i'm like i wasn't in dance like that but i knew what it did when music came on and how my body started to move and i was like oh like it so i understood that it meant something to me the movement and being able to express that was definitely something but I was like, I don't know if I want to do this as a career anymore Um, Mm. because of that. Like, you know, seeing Toshi live it, like he loves that, you know? So I was like, we're not the same. We're not the same on this. And I was like, and I was okay with that, but just understanding like this isn't my financial lane. This isn't my, you know, I can't work in this. Um, And I kind of put dance away um, before, you know, for a while before the pandemic hit, um, because of Mm -hmm. that. And I kind of got too focused on business. Like, look, if it's not in the lane that I'm in, I'm not doing it. And that was, that was actually a bad scenario for me because I didn't have an emotional outlet because I didn't really realize how emotional that is for me. I didn't really get that until, you know, shit really hit the fan with me. And I was like, okay, so that and then music was the same thing where I loved creating music, singing, producing, all that. But I didn't like the lifestyle that came with it. Because I was like, all right, if I want to do this for real, I could. Do I want to become a recording artist? I could. I could do it at a high level if I really wanted to. Awesome. But I don't want. I would. I was at studios at Record One in LA when you see certain artists come out and people are paparazzi. But then the producer would come out the studio and nobody would recognize him. And I'm like, what? Like, he's the one that got all the bread. Like, the artist is making the money on tour, not on the, on. So I'm like, 
I was like, okay, that's the person that I want to, I want the, I want the lifestyle without people in my business. So, uh, so nice. I was like, all right, I need to separate <laughs> this from that. Um, so I alienated these artistic outlets for myself. Right. And it was like, well, if I can't be in it a hundred percent, I'm not going to do it. And it, it made me struggle emotionally and I didn't know why I didn't know what was going on. And then once that hit and I started to really look into myself and start going therapy and stuff. And they were like, you know, what, what do you do for your hobbies? What are your hobbies? And when this question got asked, this was so deep because my hobbies had become my job. Tech, anime, comics, movies, that became my job. So I, I was like, well, I, I, my hobbies are, are kind of what I do for a living. It's like, well, you need new hobbies. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have anything else but work. And I was like, you, oh. it's, it's, it's rough because I have a feeling a lot of people get caught up in, in that because you, you keep hearing the rhetoric, do what you love, love, love what you do. Right. And you right. hear it and it sounds real good. It sounds good. And so you're like, so you're like, okay, all right. So let's take everything that I love and then make it everything that I do. And then you're right. left with your situation where you can't separate it anymore. And then you've got Correct. nothing allowing you to disconnect. Um, I, I think a lot of people need to hear it because there's there's so much opportunity in being able to do exactly that. Do what yeah. you love, love what you want and make a business out of it. Be right. successful around it. Um, but you gotta, you gotta car, if you're in it early, Carve out some time and some safe spaces of the thing that you love, even if it's your job, carve it out. Um, yeah. yeah, I've been I've been in gaming for now 10, close to 10 years now, and I still love playing video games because I will not play certain video games on stream for content or anything like that. Oh, speak on it. I love it. I love these games and I could right. I could make content for days. I right. because I I dump 500 hours into it and that's 500 hours of content that could be made. But you know right. what? I would start hating it if I had mm. to also be entertaining Mari and make every tedious thing that I do in games something that would be interesting for other people because I know it wouldn't be. The way I play my RPGs is disgustingly tedious and boring as fuck. No one wants to see that shit, but I love it. And right. then if I knew that I couldn't do any of that stuff and only make it for content, I know that I would start hating video games. So, Yo, that, carve it out. I, I speak on this so much when people ask me to react to like One Piece. React to One Piece. Like, no. There, I was like, I need a filter of what is content and what is not. There's certain shows that I just won't do stuff to. Or I'm like, look, you guys want to react to this? That's fine. But I need stuff just for me. Like, I need to be able to wake up and just lay in my bed and watch something if I want to. Yeah. Not- and, and, and the reaction sometimes is this. No one right. wants to watch that. But that's your right. genuine reaction. And right. Like- <laughs> right. And I'm just like, look, like some things I don't want to make, which is why I, I've juggled the idea of doing vlogs. Like, I've juggled it. But I'm like, I don't want my life to become content. Yeah. And and this is something that I know a lot of people didn't really fully understand with like the Paul brothers. Like, do I agree with everything they do? No, obviously. And they they did start out when they were kids, guys. Mm-hmm. But think of think of this scenario. You're you do something crazy online as a teenager. You get all this attention. And you're like, okay, what can I do to one up that craziness that I just did? And you're just doing this and you almost become a parody of yourself. Yep. And as a teenager, especially a guy getting that kind of attention, guys don't get attention like that. Women get attention like, nope, like it's you wake up, you have attention, right? We exist. We're like, okay. Right. Like you guys get attention for existing. Men don't really get that. And also in, in that space is like this really weird Men are socially awkward by nature. We have to learn how to be social creatures. Women are way more social and like nurturing, like 
than guys are by definition. You know what I'm saying? In the same way, like if you a woman has a baby, she grabs the baby, she knows how to hold the baby. The husband is usually like, oh, how do oh, how do I what? <laughs> right? Like husbands never really know how to carry their baby when they first have it. They're like, ah, uh, uh, it's it's awkward. There's just certain things that women are just naturally better at. So in that scenario, you have a, a young, attractive teenager get all this attention. Okay, uh, let's one up each and now your life becomes content. Everything you do now becomes content. And then it's like, well, how, at what point do you lose track of what's real anymore? Like what's, Mm -hmm. what is real and what isn't, what are you doing? Are you living your life now just to film crazy shit? And now it's like, are you living a life or are you producing a life? Like what, what are we really doing right now? And I was like, I don't know if I want to put myself in that scenario. And I don't know if I'm built for that. I know some people can do that and it works for them and it's fine. And, and I watch content like car vloggers and stuff. I love cars. So it's like my big thing. So watching people do mm-hmm. like daily vlogs and their car builds and stuff. I think that's super interesting, but I'm like, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I'm built for that. Yeah, so, I get that. Every time I do a vlog, I, I, there's a level of like, not living in that moment because I'm thinking two steps ahead mm. as opposed to if I if I didn't have a camera on, I would just be having a conversation. Oh, not, thanks. oh, where's this conversation going? Oh, okay, all right, maybe we cut it here. All right, right. Uh, what's the next what's the next thing that I gotta do? Oh, I gotta get some B-roll. And it's um <laughs> That's so it true. starts to plague it's like it, it plagues you because you're you're playing a producer at the same time and right um i think some of the most beautiful moments and conversations that i've had with people would have been different if there was a camera there even if it was a voyeuristic hidden camera but right. we knew it was there mm-hmm. those connections the 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 things that we were able to talk about wouldn't have happened mm. um, because there's that filter all of a sudden of like right. needing to be something blank, right? Entertaining, right. M- m- like crazier or wittier or whatever it is. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't change that for the world. Like I, I'd much rather just know that um, I've had a, a, a deep, real conversation um, but I think it took me a long time to get there because I'm like, ah, oh, that could have been content. You know, I've done like, that too. I've, I've done that too. I've done it too. <laughs> it's a, it's a weird thing. It's so and then weird. When you take it away. You're like, oh, is that gross? Right. Is that gross? I mean, I think there's a, there's a humanness to it of like, I want to capture that moment in like, it's like a slice of pie and preserve it so that I can rewatch that moment 20 years later and be right. like, oh, that was a nice, beautiful moment. But right. it's hard to replicate that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's hard to get that magic with that filter of a camera staring at you. And I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll get to a point where we have – Google glasses on all the time and those cap those moments can be captured like record the last 30 minutes, you know? Right. Right. Who knows? Maybe we'll have that technology, but the time but the way it is now, I think it's hard to get real authentic moments unless it's kind of like this. I think a podcast is maybe the most um the the closest thing to how a regular conversation goes and how it ping pongs into different directions but an edited vlog you're only getting the most heightened moments of people true and it's it shouldn't be expected that that is how things that 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 life is like and it's weird because i'm a complete culprit of not only consuming but creating that type of content so yeah it is yeah i mean but i think that's the thing that where it's like you know what content looks good. You know what content works well. So I think that's the thing as a creator, you find like, to your point, what content do I want to like, oh, I could have done this. I could have, that could have been a dope video. Like, like, you know, when it happens, you're like, damn it. If that was on camera right now, like that would have been wild. 
so you you understand it enough to know, I think it's just having the having the awareness to to separate yourself sometimes from the content. And yep. And I think when you start to build and you're growing, you're in the, in the momentum's building and it, you're having a lot of success, that can sometimes blind that awareness of I'm, mm-hmm. I may be doing too much, um, yep. too fast. Uh, and I think that you know, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird balancing beam, I think. Like, yeah, I think gauging what enough is for you is, is, is maybe like a good place to start. Like having, having that experience and that moment happen in real life mm-hmm. is enough for you right. to just love that moment for what it is. Mm-hmm. You don't need the approval of 2000 views and 400 likes on something for it to be more of a real moment. It already was as is you didn't need to have it on camera and mm. um, getting it through all of our heads that that's enough. Just existing yeah. and sharing that moment. That was enough. No one else yeah. needed to see it. It was beautiful yeah. on its own. You know what's crazy about that is when I started dancing again, um, I told myself, I was like, look, I'm going to start dancing when I feel like dancing. And mm-hmm. if the if the mood is right for me, I'll record it, one take, and upload it. That's it. Like, hit record and upload. Nothing, no editing, no crazy sauce. Just to just to mentally help myself understand, like, I was doing this for me anyways. Yes. This wasn't, I wasn't trying to produce something. So yes. when people would hit me up in Brisbane about teaching workshops because they would see a video of mine on, on Instagram, like, yo, like, you should come teach. And I'm like, honestly, bro, that was just a freestyle. Like, I wasn't trying to choreograph and like oh well you know if you're open to it we can put you in a weekly class I'm like I kind of don't want to do that like I was like if I come up with the piece and I feel like I want to teach it I will reach out to you um and I appreciate the offer but I don't want to feel constrained to creation or to expressing like I don't want to feel like oh I gotta this oh next Wednesday's the class okay I gotta find something and then Tuesday nights like damn I still haven't found a song yet like I don't want to oh, be oh, I hate I that feel like- feeling oh it's the worst bro that's a visceral feeling that I haven't had in a while but it was immediately it's anxiety back driven exactly it's, yeah oh yeah. no no I hated I hated it. So I was like, you know what? Let's not do that. Like, I'm just going to upload it. People ask me, yo, where's your dance video? It's like, oh, you know, when when they pop up, they will. You know, like when I feel like I, I want to move. I feel that. Yeah. Now now I do stuff all the time without it being content. And it feels, it feels really good. Yeah. It feels really good. Um, now, I mean, to your, when you were talking about like, um, you know, being okay with certain things, right? Like content wise, or I know for myself, there's come to a point of, instead of going super ham on one thing, I just been diversifying things to almost like, you know, obviously a YouTube channel, Patreon stuff, Ismahawk, Webtoon stuff, you know, in that. And I feel like you've been so good at saying, okay, I'm not just gaming. I do stuff with brands. I do, you know, this type of content. I do my acting stuff. I produce my own short films. Like you have all these things. And now this ABXY situation, which is so fire. Like what what drove you into that? Because when you show when that popped up, I was like, yo, this shit is fire. Like <laughs> where, like appreciate it. Where, like, what was the, like, the catalyst for that whole vibe for you? I feel like all, all of what I do is literally because I am gratefully surrounded by awesome people. I, mm. I really, really do. You mentioned the short film. It's literally because I know you guys, right? Like, I know you, Adonis, and I know Isma Hawk, and, and I had the ability to, to go to my friends and say, can you make my dream come true with me? 
and mm. you guys were up for it, right? And, and I think maybe a lot of it is just putting it out there and just starting conversations and and seeing if people can plug their thing into my thing. And then, and then we're like, all right, it's juiced up. Let's make this thing. Um, but... I think I talk a lot about it, um, and and that's how things go with ABXY. That's a different. That's a lot more of a homegrown situation where Peter's childhood friend named Pat, who also came to our wedding in Japan, uh, he's been making and uh, shipping out bags for a long time. A lot of oh, these wow. Kickstarter bags that get very famous, Peak Design being one of those. Um, really, he's. What? That's so dope. Oh, that, that just makes me hype. I'm sorry. I love entrepreneurship. So I like when people build shit. I just, I love that. Yeah. Continue. I, I apologize. Yeah. I really interrupted. Let's go ahead. So, no, 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 no. It's all good. Um, so he knows the business left and right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he works with somebody named Mark who used to design for Columbia. Um, uh, just, just really knows the business in and out between the two right. of them. Pat and Peter have been friends for a very, very long time, childhood friends, and they're like, how do we work together? Um, and he's like, what do you want to make? And this is pre-PS5 and pre-Xbox uh, Series X. I wanted to make a backpack that would allow you to um, take your consoles with you because we were traveling all the time. And I'm like, I want to be able to take my Xbox uh, One X with me in, right. in a solid bag. And so we had this, I don't right. want a prototype. We had this backpack where um, the front of it just kind of like flaps down and it was pretty right. pretty damn cool. Um, there was also like a divider in between. Anyway, it was it was this backpack. Um, that was the first iteration of ABXY. And then the new consoles were announced and they're ginormous. <laughs> they're ridiculously big. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think they met at some point and they're like, Let's go big. How big you want to make it? It's like, exactly. Yeah, let's, go, let's go big. It's like, you, you think it's gonna, yours is going to be big? It's like, mine's going to be on <laughs> a single desk, and you won't be able to put anything else on it. And it's also going to be a shape that doesn't fit anything Anywhere. else. Not even your shelves. Bro. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a little perturbed by it? Anyway, I'm telling you right, we threw I'm telling, out our design. That shit, I'm telling you right now. When I first saw the PS5 on the launch thing, because we reacted to it on CyberHype, I was like, oh, this is dope. And then I sat with it for a day. And (laughs) I was like, this thing is disgusting. Like, I was like, I don't know where I'm going to put this if I, like, I have a shelving on the left side of my desk where I have my consoles in. But sometimes I take them out to play in my living room on my TV. And I'm like, I don't want the PS5 out anywhere. Like, I don't want anybody to walk in. It's, I hate how it looks. Now, on the other side, people were like, yo, the Xbox looks trash. I actually love how simplistic it is. I like simple design. So, yeah. and I know some people are like, oh, well, there's no design to it. I was like, ah, see, this is where I think we disagree. I think At it's difficult it, to it, make things, yeah. Doing something you simple. You put it on the shelf. Facts. But doing something simple is actually more difficult than doing something complex. Because as soon as you start to add things, complexity by nature starts to feed in. So it's like, how do we keep this simplistic, clean, can fit anywhere visually? But even still, this thing is thick. This is a thick boy. So when you're talking about these bags, I'm like, how how do you make a backpack that fits any of these large consoles? Uh, here's your answer. You don't. <laughs> you make a suitcase. <laughs> you don't. You don't. So that, that got thrown out. And right. then so then it was like, all right, back to the drawing board. What do what do we do? And I'm like, you know what I fucking love is the switch. I think it is by far like the best console design because it's not just a console you th- take it out of the dock and it's just a free hand mm-hmm. take it wherever you go and then if you've got your dock with you you can plug it into your hotel room you can mm-hmm. go to your friend's house wherever it is it's so simple and easy but mm-hmm. it's still um a, a handheld that feels sophisticated it feels uh like Nintendo understood that their base audience grew up and now we're adults mm-hmm. and and we want something that feels not like 
uh, like a leapfrog toy laptop thing. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I think they really did that. Um, Pete and I would bring our Switch with us all the time on flights, and the little thing in the back would slip the kickstand? on the... Oh my uh, God. Yeah, it would slip on the airplane tray specifically a lot. It was just really oh, wow. slidey. And we're trying to play Smash and stuff, and it's just like you got your water cup there and it's just you think it's gonna spill anyway i'm like i want a solution to that and that's where right. abxy came from that's so dope that's so dope because i was like man and when i saw the bag i was like oh I, I like fashion so like i was just like oh this is this is a vibe i was like what's this this is dope it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty bag it's yeah. pretty it, it feels sophisticated it doesn't look like you know, and like when you want your your loud uh, Pikachu like bag, you can you can still have it. But right. when you're traveling and you want to look like an adult human being and you don't feel like having your Pikachu one out, then <laughs> right, ABXY is there for you. You, you have options. You just need you need that. You need the discreet option sometimes. Sometimes you just need something that doesn't draw the attention that you maybe don't want. Uh, exactly. Like, exactly. Okay. That's that. It, yeah. I thought that was awesome. I was like, "Oh, this is fire!" But I agree with you. I think the switch is. I remember when the switch got announced, and I, me and my brother had disagreed on this heavy. So, switch came out. My brother does a video on his YouTube channel. He was like, "Who the hell's gonna buy this? It's underpowered, seven twenty p resolution. It's like this is supposed to be a next gen console. Blah blah. This is trash. Blah blah." And I put in his comments, I was like, I think you completely misunderstood what this is. Ooh. I was like, and and I was telling people, I was like, I was like, yes, did they say it's a it's their next gen console? Sure. But what is it? It's a handheld that you can dock and play on your TV. That's what it is. It's fully in it's all in the display. Every component is in the display. So by definition, Nintendo has been known over the years to make the best handhelds, period. It's a handheld, guys. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color. Like, you could go down the Game Boy lists. They're a primarily based on, on handheld consoles. But the beauty of it is you can take it with you or dock it at home and play on the TV. I was like, there's flexibility that that's there. I was like, and you can't do that at the time. You couldn't do that with your consoles that are, co you know, connected to your TV. Um, so I thought right out the gate, I was like, yo, this is different right off the bat. And then it, the launch title with Zelda was genius. And I absolutely love Breath of the Wild. Absolutely love it. Um, oh, good. Uh, so for me, I was like, this is, this is the jam. Now... I think moving forward is going to be interesting because you have a lot of these cloud computing things with Xbox coming out where you can game kind of on any device as long as you have an internet connection. Obviously, we're still in early days of that, but that becomes a whole other competitor, right? Um, hopefully it does better than Stadia. Hopefully it does better than Stadia. Uh, Guys, but, remember Stadia? <laughs> remember, remember when that wasn't a it thing? Wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. I remember, I remember Stadia. at E3, they, they, they had this whole thing in like their, uh, in YouTube's little, um, they had like a little, uh, warehouse situation, like their little, I don't know what you call it, their little kickback room. And they have the Stadia thing up top. Did you go into that one? Mm, no, it was I don't like, think I did. Uh, I think it was either at E3 or was at Anime Expo. It was at one of the two. And okay. it was like their little room and they had like the Stadia set up. Anyways. But with Nintendo, I was like, yo, this could be dope with the whole situation now with Intel and USB 4, which is essentially USB-C and Thunderbolt combining because a dock of the Switch is USB-C. So I was like, okay, if the dock know itself- USB 4 was gonna be a thing. USB 4 is a thing? Oh my gosh, my poor PC, you're so old. <laughs> <laughs> so USB 4- It's got 4 two USB Three, three slots and it's like uh -huh. it's like it's all we've got doc it's i'm like everything's usb <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like so usb 4.0 oh. is you know what thunder you've seen thunderbolt 3 like on the max like the little usb-c port yeah essentially it's that and they just combined usb and thunderbolt together so it's usb 4 but i was thinking in my head i was like okay you have 
a lot of these um, processors coming out from uh, ARM and Apple with their own silicon, coming out with these really powerful processors that work in chassis that don't need a ton of heat management. Then you have, so you could run on the device a, a console with like a 1080p display if you want to, cool. But if your dock had extra graphics performance in it, an additional mm-hmm. processor in it that you can now connect with USB 4 and that now, you know, increases your resolution, your frame rate for your TV. That's all I was thinking about. I was like, this could be crazy moving forward. So if you really want a higher end gaming experience at home, you could actually get it. And then when you're on the go, you have your 1080p, you know, 30 FPS or 60 max, you know, depending on the title. But I was like, that could be really dope for Nintendo because the other two consoles aren't doing anything like that. Yeah. That's dope. That's dope. Do you have any predictions on when they might uh, announce their next Switch console? I don't know, man. I think I think if Nintendo's smart, they'll do it with the next Zelda game. I mm. think when the next Zelda game drops, that would be a good time to launch the that console as well. Um, that would track. Xbox. Uh, th- what do you say? I was going to say, the good thing about ABXY bags, they're modular. So when Ooh. the next uh, when the next <laughs> one comes out, it'll just be... You just take out the uh, the the silicone inside, not the silicone, the uh, the foam outside of it, and we'll we're we're gonna remap it so that you could just slap in the foam. See with the with the new console stuff. Modular. There you go. Modular. That's, that's the flexibility. I mean, I think that's the <laughs> thing with Xbox when they dropped the Series X. Like, how do you drop it without a launch title? In I mean, it, it it was obvious, like, I mean, here, PS5s are still extremely hard to get. Xbox uh, One. I think uh, Siri- it's really hard to get here, too. Series X, though, they're there. They're sitting in stores. And it's because, like, I've, I've had mine since launch day, and I have yet to play a game that is designed specifically for Series X. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are updated uh, graphics of older games, and... I'm like, and I had a, I had a one X and honestly, it, it's the graphic Same. performance. The graphics difference is not drastic enough to, to need to pay for that. So I'm just like, no, at least the, on the, the games only that are thing, out. The only thing that I'm grateful for is quick resume. Although it is very, yes. very buggy. It is. It is. It's like, it'll let you quick resume, but in 10 minutes, you're going to have to reload the whole thing. So exactly. it's about the same thing. It's about the same thing. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think the the other side of that was um, PlayStation, they had Spider-Man when it dropped. So they were like, okay, we have a next-gen title. They had their little demo game that really tested out the controller, which was really cool. Um, mm-hmm. But... I was I was like, damn Xbox, like, you know, what? Because yeah. I, I love both companies, so I was just like, I was hoping that I was gonna get a, a launch title, and then when Cyberpunk, I, I, I mean, <laughs> at least they didn't launch it with a Cyberpunk like launch of Halo, right? Like, if Infinite mm. was buggy as all hell, wasn't ready, but they launched it with Infinite. But mm. it was as disappointing as Cyberpunk's release. I don't think that they would just. I don't think that they would recover. Fair, fair. I was just very like, but my, I guess my other side was like, you guys have been working on this console for a really long time. <laughs> like you know, like what what launch title game are you dropping with the with the console though? Like to justify the reasoning all of paying their the premium. In one best. All of their eggs were in Halo's basket. And man, I mean, I remember the reaction that people had to the first trailer were like, this is it? Like, that's, this is the game? Like, I was like, oof. And I'm not a gamer like that. Like, I I enjoy games, but I'm not a gamer extraordinaire. I don't have the, the seat time that a lot of people online have with games. So... From my perspective, like, oh, it looks, it looks cool. Like, it's cool. But 
some people were just like, yo, this isn't it. Like, y'all need to. They are picking that thing I'm apart. Excited. I'm excited to play an Xbox Series X game. Yeah. When when I do right now, I'm playing an 11 year old game. I'm playing I'm playing Fallout New Vegas. Yo, is, I've never um, played New Vegas. I've never played it. Good. <sighs> I I love it, and I and I didn't pick it up for the longest time. But now that we're in Vegas, I'm like I gotta. It's so yeah. fun because oh. you you can you can spot out all the different places and I I uh, love it and it's see. also a very good story. Obsidian mm. does such good stories. See, I need to do it because my first Fallout experience. Guess what it was? Guess what my first Fallout experience oh, was? Seventy six. It was seventy six. <laughs> it was seventy six. <laughs> it was so funny because Toshi oh, was hyping damn. up. That's Toshi gross. was hyping up Fallout. Like hard, like bro, Fallout is like when 76 come out, it's gonna be crazy, blah blah. It's like all the Fallout games are nuts. And we, we get this were. game and we're streaming together, and I was just like, bro, what is <laughs> the point? I was like, what's the point of this game, bro? Like, we're doing like I'm confused about what we're supposed to be doing right now. He's like, like, I'm so embarrassed. No, 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 no. Fallout's much cooler than this. No, no, he's yo, just having a bad day. That's exactly what it was, day. though. That's exactly what it was, though. He was like, dude, uh, he was like, this is... It was that game and Anthem. Anthem was... Uh, Anthem frustrated me to my core because when I saw the trailer, a lot of the stuff was bigger. Like, the the bazaar that you were walking in in the town was much larger in the demo. Uh, the scalable uh, vertical gameplay was much larger in the demo. Uh, in the trailer that they announced. And then when we started playing the game, while I loved the the gaming mechanics, like the movement was so cool to me. Mm-hmm. Like I really enjoyed that. But it was like every mission was the same mission. I was like, is it the same? Like we're just reskinning stuff? Like it feels like we're doing the same Which thing over and over. Which is weird because the way that it looked initially was like, oh, it's Destiny with Iron Man, right? Like it's like, like and and... and Essentially, Destiny is a lot of the same missions okay. on similar planets. Okay. And then when there's an expansion, it's different missions that are still similar on the same planet. So okay. I feel like they could have gotten away with it. Um, because in a lot of ways, not all games need something different, something changing all the time. Mm. Um, but... Anthem, man. I think it was a disappoint, a grave disappointment for so many people. Yeah, because visually, I mean, it looked really pretty. Like, it was a pretty looking game. And, like, you would go to the stores and the bazaars, and each store had the same shit in it. I was like, why is there two, three different stores and they all carry the same stuff? I was like, what is, what's going on? Uh, there wasn't enough customizability. Like, all of, all of the javelins looked like you, you'd buy like armor, and it's like we'll only have two armor sets that you could buy. You're like, what? Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on? Like, it just, it felt really unsupported. And then like the raids came out, and the loot was pretty bad. And you're like, okay, like all right, well. And I was just, we were playing it, hoping that the updates would just make it better, and just never did for us. And I was like, damn it, like. So I was like batting zero for two that that early in that year, with those two oh, games. Oh man. Yeah. I was like, that's man. rough. That's one hundred twenty dollars yeah. down the drain. Oh, it's so expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Fallout New Vegas is on Game Pass right now. Yes, I saw that. I was like, Tosh was like, you need to play it. I was like, all right. <sighs> yeah, hell yeah. It's um, I mean, it's 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 an old game. There's broken stuff about it, but I think the story is so good. Mm. Yeah. Written what's been well. like your go? What's been like? I mean, because you've been gaming like you said for like ten plus years. So like like. What's been like your game that you're like, I love this game? It used to be Smite uh, when we were all mm. uh, uh, playing or when we were all working in the same office at Smosh Games. Mm-hmm. We would all play uh, Smite. We would just get in a couple of games here and there between work and after work. We would play like for hours after work. Um so for a long time it was Smite. Now that we're not in an office, it's harder to harder to play. Um, but I think prior to like New Vegas, I I completed Witcher three to a point where I don't have any more missions to do. 
I've, mm. I've completed anything and everything that I can do, except for three bugged missions that I can't, um, I, I, I can't, can't complete oh, no. them because they're, because they're bugged. Um, but yeah, I get real, real heavy on like RPG, action, action adventure RPGs, Red Dead, um. Red Dead's awesome. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, of course. Plat- I've never Platinum played that. it. And then, oh, damn. Is, is Ghost tight? Like, I, I have a PS4, so I, I can play it. I just haven't played it. It's beautiful. It really okay. is. And I don't know if you have any interest in playing um, with Japanese uh, voice actors. I always but do. I think they're going to re, re, they're going to remap it now so that the, the lips are synced with the Japanese voice actors and not just the uh, American version. So um, hold on, they're out. calling it a director's cut. So hold on time out. So the game, even though it, does it take place in Japan? Hmm. So it takes place in Japan and the default voice lip situation is English. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna lie, that's a little strange. That's a little weird. I mean, because I played Final Fantasy VII Remake and the, I think the default is Japanese. I think the default for that game is Japanese. I, I think, think it has to do with the um region. The audience. You know, I think it's the audience. I feel um, like there are a lot less Japanese players who want to play Japanese set games, like about mm, Japanese history. Got it. Um and and I, I'm not really sure. I think it's just a cultural thing. I think that there is a lot of like, um, uh, like Western worship sort of stuff where, where rather than diving into their culture, um, they'd rather dive into others. And, and for us, I think that it is, I don't know. We, we, we are, I think we are more interested in their lineage mm. at times. Got it. Even though that there's like a great pride there for them, I think that if they can play a game where the the characters not don't necessarily look a lot like them, but they're more like fantastical, I think they might. As as like as a macro like baseline sort of thing. So it was it was mapped for a European audience originally. Got it. But director's cut now. Ooh. is going to be remapped. So I'm a, I'm going to have to check that out cuz I I've been hearing yeah. great things obviously about the game. It has great great publicity for sure. I was just like, man, like I think at the time it was that and I think I was either getting ready to play Final Fantasy 7 or cuz I think that came out before Final Fantasy 7, right? Or did it not? Mm, I don't, I don't remember, remember what the overlap was, but I remember I was on 7 remake for like I was like, yes. Please, yes. I it just <laughs> Definitely hit during pandemic when I think we weren't going out a lot. And it's just the scenes, the scenery is so beautiful. I think it's a very quiet spatial game unless mm-hmm. you're fighting. But right. otherwise, if you're just kind of existing in the world, it's a, it's, it's a quieter game than, than a lot of others, I think. You hear a lot of wind. You hear a lot of the elements. Okay. I may have to check that out then. Because I've been looking for another game to play. I know Fallout's going to... New Vegas is on the list for sure. But I think Ghost on PS, I think that's that might be the move. That might be the move for sure. Cause yeah. I wanna, Depends I wanna, on your patience level. I mean, I'm cool with good. I'm cool with cool stories, though. Or is it, is, okay. is it just yeah, difficult? No. I was saying the, the patient level for um, New Vegas because there's some there's some buggy, buggy stuff about it. But Oh, is there? It's like you're trying to pick up something and you're like... <laughs> old game <sighs> mechanics <laughs> yeah just twirling and twirling and twirling I'm like I'm on it I'm on it yeah yeah but, I mean I don't know I'm true for it still so I was actually thinking about this the other day um after our conversation and I was like I was just kind of go back and and seeing like when I first worked with you was on the Megazord versus Voltron video that we did. And I was like, I I think I met a lot, because that was the first time I met you, Justine, Xavier. I met everybody there that for that first time, actually. It was the first time I ran into I I met Nico at um at E uh no at VidCon 
uh, a little mm. bit before that, but I think that was the first time I met with you guys. So like seeing you go from, like you working with us at that time and now doing something with Jake, uh, which I saw on your Twitter. Uh, yeah. Like how does how does uh, you going from the things you've been doing online and working with us and doing so with Jake like. How has this experience been for you, like, creating stuff and being, like, in film? And, like, how has that been? It just makes me so grateful. And, uh, you know, you, even with things like with, with Jake and, and working with you guys for the first time, John Carl is the person who, who brought me on to um, onto the Isma Hawk film set. And so he is... He was managing, I believe, for Studio 71 back yeah. then. Um, mm. And we had mutual friends. But, um, you know, and, and then for, for Jake, uh, we met each other at the Star Wars, um, pr- at a Star Wars premiere. Mm. And then we just kind of like very, very loosely like kept in contact, but nothing more than that. I think the point of my story is you just never know whose radar you are going to be on. Mm. Um, and that that is kind of like the the good and bad of social media, right? Like it's it's a way for people to keep tabs on you without you ever knowing. Right. Um, but it it certainly is a way for people to be like, oh, I wonder who, what so-and-so is up to. I remember them from blah, blah, blah. Uh, they might be perfect for this thing. Um, but I, I think that I've, I've always maintained the, the motto to show up and don't be an asshole. And it's taken me it's a good motto. where I am today. And I, I, I think it, it, don't it goes be an far, asshole. you know, and like, yeah. And like showing up me can mean a lot of different things, you know, and, mm. and I was just having a conversation with somebody who I guess I had said that to her as like a, as a piece of advice years ago, maybe like in 2016. Mm. Um, and she's taken that to heart since then, but she's like showing up means a, a lot of things, you know, it's like showing up for other people, showing up for yourself, um, showing up when you don't want to. And, mm. and for me, I think most of all, it just means show up because you never know what, what it'll lead to. Right. Um, if you go in with zero expectations, you can't predict what one conversation, what one interaction might lead to um, down the road. And right. and for me, I think I, I got to that understanding with the way I stumbled upon and fell ass backwards into this entire life with Smosh. Mm. Um, you know, it was it was something where I, I I found an opportunity on the equivalency of of Craigslist. <laughs> was on set with them. We okay. got along and they said, hey, will you come back tomorrow for a possibility of a recurring role? Mm. I drove back that night, which took two hours to drive home. As it does. And I said, I don't know if I'm going to go tomorrow. It's, oh. it's a four-hour drive back and forth. Right. I don't really know what it's for. It's non-paying. Mm. It's a very vague thing of what a recurring role is. Right. And honestly, I had just looked up who they were, so I didn't know who they were really. Mm. Um, and so there's all these things where if I had been in the mentality of what can I get from this, I probably wouldn't have showed up the next day. Right. But um, I, being a starving artist, had nothing going on that day. Right. So I did show up, and that turned into... A, a a permanent job with them for 10 years that has now launched me into whatever the hell I am doing right now. So it's like you just never know what showing up to something will lead to. Um, but the second component of that is just don't be an asshole. <laughs> that's a big one. Simple as that. I mean, so like what – so that's so interesting because you – everything makes sense in hindsight. But – in the moment, you're just kind of like, I'm just thinking of myself, like going through what you were talking about. I'm like, damn, like there was a point at which she didn't know if she wanted actually to go back to this callback. You know, it's like, I can't even think of you not having that journey with Smosh Games. Like, in hindsight, it's kind of like, what? What, what, what do you mean? What happened? 
right. complete alternate reality. It, it, is, it is a single pivot point right. of my life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think because of that, because knowing that I am just extremely grateful for the entire journey. And I, I, we had talked about that sort of, um, paved road that I was on when I was dancing. Right. Um, that road is still there. You know, I could pick up and, and start teaching and inherit a school essentially, um, if I, if I was on that path, but I'm on a path where I have no idea where it leads to. There isn't a book or a manual that would tell me these are the um, flag points that you should be looking for. I don't know where the next marker is down the road. Right. And, and for somebody who likes to be calculated and prepared for, for this, you would think that I'd be freaking out, but... I think that it is so freeing. Mm. And as long as if you have a grateful attitude, everything that comes through to you feels like a gift. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I feel like the I'm in the, I'm the same way when it comes to this cuz people had asked me like, you know, who who do you talk to for advice in the space in your family like you have and I'm like, guys, like honestly like I can't I can't ask my parents about what I should do in X, Y, and Z. Like they I'm doing something that nobody in my family has ever done. So it's it's like this really weird, like you said, like you don't know what is the next move, what that's going to do. But there is an excitement in not knowing what move is going to be the right move. You're like, damn, okay, well, let's try it, see what happens. Like, so it's I agree. There's a free, there's a freedom to it. And also a very strange fear at the same time. It's like, mm. you're excited, but you're kind of like, Ooh, but if this doesn't work, what am I going to do next? Like, it's like, you just, what it's, you do? It, it's so weird, but yeah, I think that's too. One of the things that I ask people when they ask me to become a creator, like, what should I, you know, how should I do X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, it's very similar. Like, it's very similar to people that want to do any profession. Some people have just a natural vibe for it. Like they have a knack, they're built for doing this type of work um, to where they can do the crazy hours. They could, you know, be a one man team for a while until they can afford to have other people to come on and help. Um, you know, like that, that takes a certain type of person to do deal with, uh, criticism on a daily basis on the stuff that you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, public opinion about like that, that's a certain type of person that can do that in the same way that I can't be a rocket scientist. Sorry. I love science, but guess what? I can't do that. Like that's not in my skill set, or do I have the patience to want to learn that skill? So I think it just really comes down to that awareness piece of like, Try it and see if you like it, but having an expectation yeah. of how it should play out may not be the best way to go about it. Is just maybe playing it and see if you like it. Start out as a hobby, and if you end up enjoying it, maybe take it a little more serious. But having people jump in and quit their jobs and I want to become a streamer or a YouTuber, or I'm just like, yeah. ooh, that's a hey. If you really feel like you could do that, like, I'm not going to say don't, but you got to be built different for that. For sure. I always say, make sure that you have had a job that has absolutely crushed your soul before, that you absolutely <laughs> fucking hated because anything and everything you do in, in, in this industry, not sleeping for days because you have to get an edit done uh, you know, dealing with computer crash after computer crash and then going oh, yeah. live and being, hey, how's hey. it going? And just, you know, not putting that on on whoever you are presenting with or, or the right. audience. All of that, you will be able to handle so much better and be grateful for it, problems yeah. and all, if you have had a soul-sucking, terribly disgusting, awful job in your life because you know what it could be 
and you yeah. know that you could return to that, and you'll say, no, I will work my fucking ass off to do whatever I can to not go back to that. Because if you don't know that life, it's so easy to take so much for granted in this. I could not agree more. <laughs> I could not agree more. <laughs> My the crazy part about that is like, you know, a lot of people's parents, you know, that have come from minority households or immigrated to the states, um they went through something that we didn't need to go through, right? Like whatever struggles they've had, whatever, what, like they got us and set us up for a different starting point. And yeah. in that it's like, all right, we're not them. Like they have a level of drive that we don't have. They have a level of hunger that we don't have. They have a level of sensitivity that like they, they are not sensitive people. Like that generation is, and, and older are a, a different breed of people. And mm -hmm. in that, it's like, all right, starting at that point and now moving forward, it's like, okay, if if I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, I can't really rely on them to help me in, in a space that they really don't know much about. Uh, but at the same time, you don't know a struggle really unless you've got into a struggle. Like... So for me, like I didn't grow up poor, but we didn't grow up rich. Like we were, my dad was live, we lived way under our means. I didn't know what he had or didn't have. I just knew that I was hooping and I wanted J's. And he was like, I'm not spending a hundred dollars on those shoes, dude. Like you're out of your mind. Like, like what? <laughs> like, you know, like going to swap meet, getting clothes, wearing stuff in Walmart, going to Bugle Boy and buying jeans. Like I'm talking about, we, we were balling, right? So- but we didn't, we didn't never not have, right? We weren't struggling. At least I didn't know if we were. I never felt that. So until I got out and was mm -hmm. on my own and felt the, okay, I go into my apartment and there's no furniture besides a, a, you know, a coffee table and a mattress. Or I go into my refrigerator and it's just condiments. There's no food in there. Or it's just <laughs> mac and cheese and ramen in Vienna sausages. Like, you know, like... You don't know until you're at a certain point when you've had stuff and then you don't have it. And you're like, okay, I remember a life when I wasn't struggling, but that wasn't mine, right? And then I went on my own and now I'm struggling like a motherfucker. Like, I do not want to live like this. So <laughs> having that switch for me and being able to be in, you know, advantage, uh, having the opportunity to work for certain people being mentored by certain people because of friends that I knew. Um, and then ultimately becoming an employee at Apple, you're like, oh, this is this is different. Like, this is great. So even though I didn't have the emotional disdain for my job, I had a lifestyle that I did not fucking want. I was like, I never want to go mm -hmm. back to that. I never want to go back to that. And I think that's what drives me of like, when the pandemic hit, us online, we didn't really understand the position we were in until the pandemic hit. We didn't understand, mm. I think, culturally as internet creators, how far ahead of the regular world we are. Yes. It's it's terrifying. It's like, yo, like, so we were, <laughs> we're quarantined and people are like, oh, how's quarantine? I'm like, honestly, like, I don't feel quarantine at all. Like my life changed zero. Yeah. And I had to really take a step back and be like, dude, your life is not the norm at all. And mm -hmm. it was really hard for me to, to really digest that of like, dude, like you're really in a privileged situation. Whether or not you got there on your own is irrelevant. Understand the situation you are now in that 99% of the world are not in now. And that was a weird mm -hmm. space to be in as a creator. It was like, for the first time, a creator became like, oh shit, like you're, you're a creator. Like it be, yeah. it held yeah. a different weight instead of like, oh, you're a YouTuber. You're, look at you, YouTuber. Like it, it Dude. felt different. It did. And, and everyone looked like a YouTuber by the, you know, like, 
a couple months into the cor- into quarantine, you know, it's like Seth Meyers was the YouTuber essentially. <laughs> Stephen Colbert became a YouTuber. I mean, and then and then actually people started making content because they didn't have work. Brie Larson and right. uh, John Krasinski, you know, it's like people started doing this life. And I think for a lot of them, they're like, oh, this is hard. Yes. You have to be your own everything. And you everything. learn to be so scrappy doing this stuff. But it's it's also so fulfilling to know that you can wear 10 different hats at the same time, get something off the ground. And when you're in a position where someone says, let me take nine of those hats for you and just you wear the one, instead of having the audacity to feel like like you are turning your nose up at it, I think you have a much better understanding of how grateful you are for the situation that you're in. Yeah. Um, and so I... I, I, I hope that um, more and more content creators, and there's going to be so many more content creators who, who, who flood this industry, yeah. um, come with that mindset. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. It's an interesting space to be an interesting time, I think, to be online and creating. I think TikTok is a, a really interesting space. Uh, you know, I've done stuff on the platform, but nothing really like, okay, let's build on TikTok, right? Like, but I think, you know, that whole thing is really interesting with artists. And I see like dancers getting really uh, precious about uh, the non-technical style of dance that's on there, more like party dances blowing up. And then they'll put up their piece and like, why isn't my piece getting at? It's like, yeah, bro, because that content's too complex, bro, for TikTok. That's why. Like, And I think yeah. it's people not understanding that you have to adapt to the platform. Like the platform isn't, it, the platform is, did I grab your attention in this amount of time? And can I participate in said content? And yes. I think some people and, just can't. And if there's content creators... If there are content creators watching this, adapt, but also don't put all your eggs in one basket. Facts. Vine, a Vine situation could happen at any point. Remember that all of these platforms are free platforms that you get to put your content your content on. They can pull the plug whenever they want. They owe nothing to us as creators. Facts. So don't put all of it into one basket um, because it could be yanked out at any point. TikTok is a really good example of it that it could have... It could, it could have, like, been banned, right, last yeah. year or two years ago. So yeah. something like that that is completely out of our hands, even if it's really doing well and it's popular, it right. could be yanked at any point. So just remember that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's something that even on YouTube, I tell people all the time, like, yo, like, stuff changes all the time. Algorithms change. The goalpost changes. And you adapt or die. It's kind of the situation. Like, it's... It's kind of the, it's kind of it, guys. Like, there's nothing really. There's no crazy science to it. It's just understanding that, to your point, that that diversity online is is huge, uh, and I'm starting to get better yeah. at it. Get it's just... to a place. Sorry, uh, I was gonna say get to a place where the number of views don't matter because the back end of how you're running your business is not dependent on the number of views, but more so the value you can bring um, right. as a whole. So and, yo, not everything that you see from the outside is is what's actually happening because somebody who has a million views on every single TikTok could be making zero dollars. But somebody who's who has got a niche audience getting 5,000 views on their TikTok but know how to talk about brands to their audience and that brand understands that is probably making cash. Yo, I'm telling you this right now. Like I, I think I was talking to Mr. An- uh, Mr. Senpai about this and it started out when I was getting brand deals on my, when I was doing tech stuff early on. And then when I started doing anime reactions and companies would start reaching out to me to do stuff and I would do brand deals with them and other creators in that space would also be a part of a similar brand thing. And some people are like, hey, like, you know, why did you decide to do X, Y, and Z? Or like, hey, quick question. Like, I just want to know, like, you know, did did you get paid for X, Y, and Z on this? And I would say, no, I got way more than that. 
they're like, what? Like they offered me this. I was like, they offered me that too. I was like, it's like, it's, you don't get paid what you're worth. You get paid what you negotiate. You didn't negotiate it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, they're trying to get companies, even with employees in advertising, they're trying to get as much as possible with the least amount of investment. That's business. I want my, I want my employee to give me the most amount of result for the least amount of pay. That is business. So it doesn't, nothing changes in that. But if I give you a breakdown and they say, this is the biggest thing that I've noticed. So we're, I'm giving you free game people on YouTube right now. Companies are going to hit you up and do these deals of links. And some of, some of the affiliate marketing stuff is cool. You need to obviously understand your, 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 your uh, user base and how they engage with you and all that. That's great. However, also take into consideration this. When companies reach out to you and say, hey, we want you to do this ad, put a link here, and we'll pay you per whatever. People buy based on how many times they see something. That is sales 101. There's like seven times that somebody sees something that they decide they want to buy it. So if they're saying, hey, we're going to give you based on conversion, no, no. Do you don't, you don't, do you think these companies pay for conversion on a commercial and a TV network? No, they get paid for exposure mm -hmm. because how many times that person mm -hmm. sees it. So if they say, Hey, we're going to pay you 25 cents per click. I'm like, okay, but let's say the person sees my brand deal on mine first. And then three videos later, sees it again. And then three videos later, sees it again. And on that person's video, they decide to click the link. Do I get a kickback for exposing that person for the first time? No. So no, we're not doing that. Like I'm not doing that. Now, some people may, and certain people's follower base, it, it makes sense. But understand, take into consideration that they're coming to you because it's direct to consumer. There's value in that, right? There's value. They're, they're hitting you up for a reason. So I'm not saying mm -hmm. don't know your worth and, and say, oh, well, I want eight Gs for like, chill out. What I'm saying is, don't just take somebody's offer because you've never had a brand deal before or you think it sounds good and understand that people's buying habits are a thing. So, and negotiate stuff. If you know how long it's going to take to research a product or to research a service or play a game or whatever, you need to factor in the time it's going to take for you to do that. How long is it going to take to you to shoot the ad? Mm -hmm. uh, like, and, and, and you jot that down and say, this is the time it's going to take. This is the cost it's going to be for the time. Figure out a way to understand so people know that you're not just a person they can take advantage of. And if you come to them correctly, a lot of yes. times they'll come back with the counter offer or they'll accept your offer. But it's a... Dude, it's, there's always wiggle room. Always. 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 <laughs> always. They'll, say, they'll, they'll say final offer. It's never really a final offer. They'll say, yeah. There, it, may be, it, may, it may be your final of offer. <laughs> it may be your final offer. But no, I yeah. agree. The, the amount of times that I have walked and then they're like, oh, we can come up to the price. I was like, oh, I was ready to walk. Yo, the takeaway is the move. Sometimes the takeaway is it. You take yeah. away something yeah. from somebody, it's like, oh, hold on, what, hold on, what, oh, wait, 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 hold on, maybe we could just, maybe we could discuss something. Oh, that's, that's a they move. They turn into third, th third graders. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I, I think it, it comes down to like, be smart, know your business, be humble and, um, and, and know how to talk to people, you know? Mm. And it's like, don't be an asshole is, is a, is a, is a sister to like, the way that you treat people, the way you speak to people with with knowledge and respect um, and an understanding of the business will get you mm. so far uh, because a, a conversation going sideways could be the thing and the tipping point of, of something going terribly wrong or terribly right. And like you hear in so many businesses, a lot of it is who you know and how you interact with somebody. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that business is business, but at the end of the day, if somebody rubs you the wrong way, you're probably going to go with the person that, that rubs you the right way, 
even uh, even though that person might have a smaller following, maybe they don't have Facts. as much reach. But who are you going to have to work with? Yeah. Someone who's awful or someone who you get along with? And so having the self um, awareness of how you come across when you speak to people is is an investment that is extremely worth it and something that is not necessarily taught at school. So you might want to double check. You know, I, I, I think that there's. There's there's ways to to figure out if if you cross lines and whatnot, and if it, if that is you, it's okay. There's so much time and room in your life to improve it, but getting to a point where you can say, ah, I need to I need to fix this. It's difficult because it's mm. yourself. You're right. talking about yourself, but I hope that you you give yourself. The, um, the the time and the energy required to better yourself because it will better your business no matter what you do. Right. Across the board. That's great advice. Now, I, I have a final question because I think, because I might drop, bars. Uh, so being a creator, you, like you're an OG on the platform. I've, I've always respected what you've been able to do and, you know, being able to just, obviously stay not just relevant, but you, you, I don't know. I feel like you just know where to move um, and you move so well. And I think <laughs> in that space, it's, and I think a lot of times, like as an artist, as a creative, it's so easy to get emotionally tied to stuff, right? Like um, you get passionate about things and sometimes you don't know when to just say, it's time to move on. It's time to say, we're good here, let's shift gears and move over. Um, in the creator space for yourself, what do you think if you could go back and tell your early creator days, Mari, a piece of insight that you know now, then? Like, what would you tell yourself then, like, mm. as a creator? Um... It's it's hard for me to think of it from a non like emotional side of it because I think that there's so much trauma from like the Defy fallout mm. and that that kind of reverberates into the industry with so many people. Um, mm, and for fair. those of you who don't know, Defy was the umbrella company that owned a lot of IPs like Clever, Made Man. Uh, and Smosh was one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of embezzlement that was happening within the company. Wasn't and the uh, company Philip DeFranco on, on just that as a, well? Or no? Was that something different? Was Philip under that as well? Uh, it was Matt Pat. Matt, Matt Pat, Pat was, was a, was a, like a, like an MCN partner. Right. And so there were a lot of people who were completely wronged in the end because, uh, the company on just a random Friday sent out an email saying, grab your stuff, we are shuttering the doors. Mm. And just like that, all of our jobs were gone in a single day. Right. Um, and, and from the outside, you know, you see, you see businesses like Smosh and, and it's, a, it's an absolute machine, but the mother company that owned this IP hold it away. So now what do you do? Um, right. And so I feel like I have a lot, I still carry a lot of that trauma when it comes to um, dealing with contracts and big businesses. Right. Um, but I think that I would tell my younger creator self that, that, um, that you, that you're enough. Um, and for me, I think a, a lot of, a lot of the reasons why I stayed at Defy for so long. Um, part of it, I think, is like this very cultural, like, company um, respect that I felt like I, I inherently had, where mm. I'm like, I am, a, I am a salary man at this company. I work for it, and therefore, um, they're king, right? Like, everything right. That, that I do is for this company. And so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of also I work with my friends and it's it, I can't imagine another um, environment to be in. And so I stayed there for longer than I should have. Mm. Um, 
And my decision to stay was some, some parts fear of not being enough on my own and being able to stand on my own two feet. Some of it was uh, just emotional ties of being there and being with friends. Um, and some of it was, well, I work for this company that, that pays me well. Mm -hmm. Why should I look elsewhere? Right. Um, and so I think I would have told myself that like our advice of there's always wiggle room, right. there's also always other paths that you can take. And so I would, I would tell myself that you on your own are enough. Um, and you don't always need to be within a collective, um, to, to exist and to, and to thrive. Uh, that's wisdom right there, guys. That's experience. That is experience. And I, I, I always <laughs> say experience is the best teacher. Um, you know, you have, sometimes you have to live things that to be really just have the, the insight of maybe how to move differently or, or if that move was the right move. And I appreciate that, uh so fire but Mari I appreciate you man you're always like a dope person to chat with and I always admire the work that you put in because you're always grinding you, you always have some new shit moving and it, it keeps me on my toes I'm like oh what's she doing like okay uh... like that shit always gets me excited so I just I like people <laughs> I just like people that have Thank it you. like have the 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 creator itch the builder itch to scratch that motherfucker like that's there is something about it for me that I've always loved watching people build stuff. I like building things myself. So it's like when I see people that can vision, envision something and just go for it. And, you know, regardless if you fail along the way to get there, that's inevitable. But it's that to me is it's everything. That's so dope to me. So uh, it's always dope chatting with you and, and, hearing your uh your insight on your experiences man and it's it's super insightful i hope people can uh really appreciate somebody of of your caliber and what you've been able to bring to the creator space uh and really take it to heart and and, and learn something from it so i appreciate your time thank you so much i really appreciate it um and i really appreciate your friendship and the insight that i get from talking to you honestly um, I, I think we had uh, so many opportunities during uh, quarantine to catch up and, and just yeah. be like, not even business, right? Just be like, how are you Facts. doing? And <laughs> Facts. I, I love our chat and I, and I really, really appreciate you. Yeah, likewise, man. Um, for those that don't know, where can they find Mari online? Uh, you can find me at Atomic Mari on most platforms. Except for TikTok, because somebody oh. else has my handle. Um, of course but do. I'm not too active on TikTok <laughs> at the moment, so um, that's okay. But yeah, you can find me online and, and uh, yeah, at Atomic Mari. Appreciate it. Sweet. Well, guys, appreciate you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you guys on the next podcast. We have to stay. Bye.